We got Sasha here. Always good to have Sasha on the show. We got Yuri here. I can't believe we got both of you guys here. We're good. Yuri, it's good to see you, man. It is. It is uh, remarkable. Well, there is going to be double trouble. The, the the both of us here. That means double trouble. And you're both sitting on the couch. So, uh, and what are we, Sasha? Can you just give us an? What are we talking about today with Yuri? Right. Uh, we're having a, a focused discussion about. Uh, uh, political ideologies uh, like communism and capitalism, more specifically uh, we are uh, looking into Marxist communism and how it relates uh, competitively to capitalism, to the scientific uh, principles, how the science is perceived uh, through their uh, respective uh, philosophical um, explanations uh, uh, and rationale. And, in, uh, and also in conjuncture to that is how the art of the day, of the turn of the 20th century we're talking about, uh, was uh, also rationalized and interpreted in terms we're talking about abstract uh, art and birth of the modernist and all postmodernist and so on movements. So how it's all interconnected into various uh, philosophical and political ideologies of the early 20th century. So Yuri is here is going to... Uh, give us uh, more on the insight uh, in detail. The, the Mark, Marxist epistemology. Epistemology. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Right. Epistemology. This is the, this is the, the interesting uh, area that I have been researching is about Marxist epistemology and scientific materialism. The scientific materialism. So it's a scientific materialism of uh, Marxist, uh, communist uh, uh, rationalization of science, which is uh, juxtaposed or uh, in uh, competition with uh, the Western uh, relativism. That's right. The, the relativ relativism and postmodernism are somehow related. And so this is what we, we want to see how did it develop into this, pro what is the process of development? And of course, I believe that um, the whole thing started with historical materialism. And historic materialism is the original formulation of Karl Marx. Of course, it all started with historic materialism. And that is that history is determined by the laws of, of matter, so the material laws, the, the history can only be understood as interplay of material forces, such as the means of production and class struggle and all that stuff. Well, we're not going into that, but is, this is just where it all started. Well, because, now why is that? Is that because it was before Marx was around, what you had, you had the kings, I mean, you had the, the, the divine, divine right, you had a slow emergence. Divine right of kings. And you had a slow emergence of democracies, uh, you know, the, with starting with the Magna Carta, for example. Well, it so goes Plato, back to the Enlightenment. To Plato. Of course it does. The Enlightenment yeah. period. Yeah. The Enlightenment period, this is really the key because Voltaire, Voltaire was maybe the, the heart of the Enlightenment. And I think this is where the, the development really starts because... And the Voltaire was uh, what an 18th century, like uh, the Voltaire was late, late 18th, 18th in the century. 18th century, and the uh, the encyclopedist. So this is the French, uh, the first encyclopedia in modern times was produced in France, and of course Diderot. So these are the the French scholars who 
published the first encyclopedia in 1750. 1750, that's where the scientific method became formalized in the, in the encyclopedia, the first encyclopedia. And of course, it was the church was opposed to that, and in fact, it was censored. The first encyclopedia, they, was, they prevented from publishing encyclopedia. And, and that's another big point, is that prior to Marx and the materialism, there was the, re the religious world out view, and we saw the, the Vatican control of basically all aspects of society, and that slowly gave way to the, the more democratic the was, nationalism of Europe and that sort of thing. It right? was based on the Bible and on the right, the divine right of kings. So it was the royalty and ecclesiastical power. They determined, you know, the politics. But so what happened uh, back in the day, the science was uh, pri pri private of very few. And so uh, uh, it, it was mainly the ruling class who had uh, insights into various uh, scientific knowledge. I even could uh, have access to books for that matter. And so uh, uh, the science at, at the time was more like a magic. It was like a hidden knowledge, right. and personal knowledge versus like a, a, a public knowledge, something that is generally known and uh, which is that at some point that religious uh, narrative of explanation, which was the public narrative and public science, uh, there, then they, it became a switch when then the scientific narrative became came from a, being a private to very few to became a uh, widely publicized and uh, and it sounds like that publish that French publication the, cyclical, the encyclopedia kind of outlining the scientific method was a milestone in that and pro hence the progress scientific of materialism science. evolving from popularization <coughs> of science in general and then then uh, forking it from uh, Greek uh, novel uh, uh, poetic uh, narratives. Well, the, con the concept of encyclopedia, <coughs> see, nowadays the modern, you know, people of the 21st century will be very surprised that the concept publishing an encyclopedia should be seen as subversive. How is it possible, like, do you think that Encyclopedia Britannica Homers, the Homers. Is, is subversive somehow? Like, well, it's not su subversive. The Wallace Fork started uh, back when the first it was a Homer, a uh, Greek Homer, a type of narrative that was pop popularized at the time was a poetic, uh, mythological uh, kind of ex uh, a narrative. And then uh, Herodotus, wasn't it, uh, together uh, with the... Uh, uh, Pythagoras, 500 BC, sometime around there. Herodotus is the father of history. Why? Because he created the scientific narrative model of parallel models. So you have if this happened, then this happened, if that happened, then this happened. So more facts based, events based, and more factual storytelling. The idea of an objective history. Objective almost, history, right? right. Yeah. Which was necessary for the scientific narrative. So the science, once Herodotus came with that uh, way of telling a story away from Homeric uh, novel, uh, po poems, mm -hmm. it became adapted by scientific narrative. So to me, uh, one of the things that I say quite often is that we're losing the sense of official history now, right? And then maybe that, that's why we're having, because I think materialism well, is... Well, they say there is more scientific. It's before there was only a few narratives that yeah. uh, uh, were known about, but now there's many uh, narratives of, uh, paralleling. Uh, oh, so everyone's got their own narrative. So now everybody has their own narrative, so you have to have then... So we're going crazy. Yuri... Is that where we're at? We're, we're at a point now where everybody's got their own narratives? Is that what this is really? Well, that's part of postmodernism. <coughs> yeah. Because in postmodernism, there is no truth, nothing is true, and, you know, there, there's, uh, everybody has their own private truth. That's part of postmodernism, I guess, you know. So, <coughs> essentially, I would say that the, the ideas of the Enlightenment, I mean, we. Yuri, Okay, so you were saying one of the elements of postmodernism is the everyone has their own private narratives. You know, now I just want to bring a whole other concept here because what's interested me about the word the word postmodernism 
and what came before it, which was modernism. In the sense, in one sense, modern means what's current and what's up to date, right? Like w this is the modern world. We look out the window. This is 2017. This is our modern city out there today. But it seems to me, what happened was, and it was I think probably in the 50s and the 60s, that um, people started to call things modern art. And to me, it was almost a generic phrase at first, not a label of a kind of art, but it was just referring to it was the a art, movement. the it was art a of its. Cur I just want to. It was a more modernist movement, and it started 1905 or something. Okay, yeah, but so, but to me, that just meant it's the current movement of art. And to me, what that really representative is our culture as a whole becoming self-conscious. Th where we call the current art of today, we now, that's what we call our art, even though it's just a generic term meaning what's, you know, what's modern today. Like what's modern in 1963 is like today we have what's modern in 2017. So the fact we call it modern and now we have to call what comes after postmodern says to me that we became kind of conscious as a culture about these things and that's probably where history comes in too because that objective history gives us a sense of our place in it and and I think that might be part of the trend that makes us everybody have their own private narrative now okay I just said all but is it a good thing I mean that's well, the question <laughs> well or if there's anything even if it's not is there anything we can do about it or how can we make it a better thing and of course yeah, I think that is the big question. Is there anywhere to go once history is ended, once everyone has their own private narrative? Well, like even uh, just to make sense of the history, we have, we're, uh, that's why we're having a conversation here about this uh, uh, Marxist uh, uh, scientific uh, materialism Marxist versus Marxist epistemology. Marxist, Marxist epistemology, epistemology it to the view of the world. Because they are like, uh, as New York Times wrote, uh, about the topic, uh, they said that the Russian uh, avant-garde was uh, uh, basically responsible uh, for the uh, creation uh, of the idea of abstract art itself, uh, uh, because they uh, uh, were coming. They weren't very uh, impressed uh, with the uh, how uh, a French school uh, uh, talking it in Cubism uh, uh, cared for the. Uh, uh, ideas of the uh, avant-garde and uh, so the uh, idea is that uh, the uh, Soviet Russian avant-garde artists they tried to use art as the uh, I ideological tool uh, uh, to uh, reshape our consciousness and, uh, and conceptions and the way we're thinking and and uh, in the so in the context of the pop Soviet uh, revolution. When, oh, okay, so those when were those Soviet or Russian avant-garde ar artists? Well, like, we're talking about like in the twenties, uh, like you know. Uh, were they sponsored uh, by the like, uh, new Soviet state, or were they? Well, they, they were actually in the minority, from what I understand. No, no, in, not in, in the, the minority. Mi uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, that was the majority view in the nineteen twenties in the Soviet Union. The the abstract art, uh, the modernist art, was the dominant movement in the 1920s. Everywhere? In the Soviet Union. But everywhere else too, no? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it was as widely embra embraced in the West. Oh, so it was it more is. accepted in the It Soviet was more widely embraced. It was the official ideology in the Soviet Union. But then it, it changed very quickly. Well, maybe because, Yuri, because the West was still clinging on to the uh, the divine right of kings and <laughs> not, not in the 1920s. Well, but I mean, they were still there. It, it's, uh, I mean, compared to the Soviet Union, which had a radical, conscious revolution, like that overthrew the old order, completely overthrew the old order. Whereas in the West, the old order, whatever it was was maybe changing, but it was evolving, not a radical overthrow. 
Well, the, the, comparison, the, the comparison of what was going on in the Soviet Union and what was going on in the West, you have to go by different countries. Like America was more conservative artistically for a long time. I mean, the big movement, I guess it goes back to Dada, you know, like Dada was big in Switzerland. It was the, the art, Dada art. That was the most radical anarchist art mm -hmm. at the time. It was actually in Switzerland. That was the Dada school, right? So anyway, you can go, and also Futurism, another movement that was based Marinetti in Italy. So these were influential. Mm -hmm. Artistic well, movement. Well, cubism, uh, cubism, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. It says that uh, the New York Times uh, writes again, and uh, for even in the early years of the revolution, when the avant garde was riding high with the official sponsorships, its triumph was politically precarious. Lenin, after all, had never been a convert of the avant garde's cultural program. So, uh, uh, he was basically into realism, and uh, as is uh, right, uh, Father Dan, that uh, the basically uh, the whole Soviet regime was actually uh, uh, devoted bulk uh, of its uh, cultural budget on the uh, uh, groups uh, of that kind of pr realist pr persuasion, and the modernists uh, remained uh, an embattled minority even in the period of their greatest power and influence. And that's why I said well, that. Well, don't, don't believe everything you read in the New York Times. Right. <laughs> well, just bringing it out there. No, uh, I mean, the, uh, I, I have read the, the original sources, and it was uh, in, in the, the, all the art schools were modernist at that time in the 1920s in the Soviet Union. It was officially, I mean, Lenin, the, yes, it's true that Lenin did not personally, Vladimir, Ilyich Lenin, he did not um, he did not get off on modernism. It's true he was more traditionally minded, but he did not impose his views. He was not he was not uh, getting involved in the politics so, of so art. So they enjoyed uh, some form of freedom until Stalin came, and then Stalin yes. had this uh, big uh, uh, shift from uh, modernism to uh, what known as neoclassicism uh, or the uh, poster production. I mean, Hitler tried to do the same, right, when he tried to, uh, or, you know, basically s control what was viewed as art in Germany. Yeah, okay. mix it with, uh, use it as a tool of poli yeah. political narrative. So, uh, But also trying to impose what y you think culture should be all about, right, rather than let the artists themselves decide, right? Right. Um, so in the 20s, the, uh, basically the modernism was uh, embraced by the Communist Party. You, you mentioned the Mayor Holt. The theater, the Soviet theater was very influential. Stanislavski and Mayor Holt, Mayor Holt uh, the uh, directors, film direct Eisenstein is, was the film director and Mayor Holt was was uh, the theater director, and Stanislavski was also a theater director. These were influential. And Mayakovsky as well. Mayakovsky was influential as, as an artist and poet. Poet, right. Okay. So here we are, guys. Like, I'd like to, uh, well, we can talk all day okay, about this stuff, but I would really like to take, so we're having this conversation about these different movements, about the impact, about how affected everything up until this point but where do we go from here like here you, you said you know is it a good thing is it a bad thing like where we're at I mean where do we go from here in terms of arts in terms of culture in terms of uh, I mean even economics po politics well, I would like to just um, my my idea that is that I that I'm interested in is that to see the modern um, philosophical developments that are going on now in society, which is postmodernism and relativism, that are, and to see how they develop, how they developed. In order, in order to know where it's going, you should know where it's been, right? So yeah. the, the history, history is important from that, from this perspective. So what I'm saying is that. What we're seeing now is really neo-Marxism, like on campus. What is going on, on 
university campuses in Canada and in the United States is obviously political correctness and postmodernism. Mm -hmm. These, these, uh, so what, which is really should be described as neo-Marxism because it is not traditional Marxism, as defined by by the classics, you know, by the classic philosophers of Marxism. So how did it develop from classical Marxism into neo-Marxism? So what we see at this time is what a bit more Stalinist kind of ideas of like super abolition of modernism and therefore in the 30s the Soviet Union was plunged into the situation where uh, artists, uh, modernist artists were basically seen as dissidents and then uh, and then he uh, 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 went into the poster art poster it's not the art at this time because we're talking about postmodernism it's not an artistic movement postmodernism is a philosophical movement it's not an artistic movement. But and where's this Marxism on campus, this, this neo-Marxist... Uh so neo-Marxism is very different from the classical Marxism. This is my main point that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to propose here, is that um, how did it develop and what happened? So what is the difference between the neo-Marxism and the classical Marxism? What obviously the main thing that is obvious is they don't care about economics. Like po postmodernists, they don't care at all about economics, whereas traditional Marxism was based squarely on economic analysis and class analysis. The poor and the rich, you know, how they, um, the conflicts that are right. going on, like labor movement uh -huh. and all that stuff, all that is completely dropped out, and instead you got subjectivism, relativism, and uh, identity politics, right? So anyway, so this is so this is how they how they developed and where did it start? It started sometimes sometimes after after Vietnam War, like uh, after well in the later stages around the 1970s. That's where postmodernism, Derrida and Foucault and all these postmodernist um, thinkers they all came to prominence in the in 1970s. So this was a sort of a, I, I believe it was a hijacking of traditional Marxism. Of traditional Marxism? Yeah, it was, it was hijacked. Well, wait a sec. Hasn't traditional Marxism been pretty much like discredited after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the economic disaster that Marxism bred? Well, well tell, tell them about That needs to be considered, obviously. That is a good question, Hugh. But we're looking at postmodernism and philosophy. First, philosophy uh, needs to be considered step by step, I believe. Okay, right? so, I, so but, but what I'm saying is that if, if Marxism was discredited, then, I, I, I mean, I'm, like, whatever's happening on the campuses, like, I wouldn't call it Marxism, and, and it does, I mean, not that I'm happy with what's going on, but if they're trying to retrieve Marxism, like they'd be better off to retrieve something else or to call it something else, I would think. And is it really even related to that Marxism? And if or if it isn't, what, where, where is it really coming from? Well, you can say that Marxism was discredited, but look at China. I mean, China now officially surpassed <coughs> the United States GNP. The, the biggest country in, in the the biggest economic uh, powerhouse in the world sure. is Marxist. But well, you would hardly call what China is doing a, a, a classical Marxist. No, it's state. not classical Marxist. I mean, it's not really. It's not Marxist uh, really. Th but they say it's Marxist. So anyway, it's not so simple. Like the most, you see, officially, China is now surpassed. GNP of China is greater than the United States, but unofficially, it may be double. You see. If you read the alternative economic uh, analysis, okay, uh, okay we're we, we, kind of getting Sasha, off the topic wait, a bit. Wait, I want to, I want to follow up with Yuri about okay. that question. First of all, I would say China's not Marxist. First but they of all. call themselves Marxist. Sure, they do, but they're not. You know, they're not. Okay. Yeah, but that is not. It's so, a Marxist capitalist. So you, that is a little bit hybrid. arrogant to say. Well, I know you're not Marxist. You say you're Marxist, but I know you're not. So that's a little bit arrogant. Well, I mean, arrogant, Marxist. I mean, Marx would. Uh, 
okay, well, I'll just leave that aside for well, a like, minute. But it, wouldn't it be better if you ask them first, like to explain it, as opposed to you impose well, their or own? Or you view. look at what Mark said about how how to run the economy, and then uh, and then look at China and see is that what Marx would have recommended? Well, is it I'm, better now? I mean, look, many most people in Eastern Europe will say that they, their life was better before. Right. And that's a that's a whole other case. Than well, China. There you go. I mean, you think it's already settled? It's not settled. Well, here. I'm not saying. But here's my question: Like when when you look at, uh, and this is I'm going to bring this back to postmodernism. But uh, if you look at what are the factors, and I've read some books about this, so I know what I'm talking about, maybe to a certain extent. But what makes the Chinese economy so good? Some people have been critical that the reason it can never catch up to the West is because they don't have the property rights and the courts that enforce property rights. I disagree. What I say is one of the reasons China is so successful is because they value education, because the people work hard to get educated and then to do their jobs, and they're producing a lot of engineers. Now, it seems to me that whatever... Well, there is a traditional Marxist because it's a focus on science, because this is what I, one of the issues that I wanted to bring up is the postmodernism, in fact, they are denying science officially. They're saying, in a way, you see this more like religion, like they're opposed. They're saying science is oppressive. Well, this is what I'm saying. And then look at the West. Why is the West in decline? The and it's because they're not producing the engineers. There you go. There you go. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're now we're on the same page. Okay. So but wouldn't it be a conflict within that Marxism then if they denying science? That po yeah, there you go. On the, uh, on the say, postmodernism, then the, uh, the Marxism is uh, sci based on scientific materialism. So, so scientific a analysis and Marxist epistemology. So this is what I find personally, I mean, like this is, uh, admittedly, this is not a common view, but, but it is, uh, you know, Reevaluating, trying to reevaluate exactly, Hugh. Just like you said, that we need to look at the, um, you know, what is the classical Marxist and re-examine, you know, classical Marxist and to see, like I'm saying that not all of it is bad. Like you cannot just throw away the baby with the bathwater. You know. Yeah, I agree with that concept. But I mean, okay, if and you're probably more familiar with Marx than I am. But how would he run an economy? That is, well, how, do the, how do the Chinese run the economy? Well, there's you know? a lot of millionaires in China. Would Marx s s recommend that as... as well, there was Central Committee in the Communist Party. Or but they what? weren't producing. Well, Unlike the, the millionaires in China what do you mean? run there's companies that produce... The Soviet Union the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party, they produce on the industrial level. So m my point of view, you see, like to, what I'm trying to say, like I started out with the Enlightenment, the ideas of the Enlightenment. Like I'm saying that Marxism, the classical Marxism, is really squarely based on the ideas of the Enlightenment, which is really scientific method and respect for reality, like the, the real world, and studying nature, like natural sciences. So this is what is important in the classical Marxist, and this is where. I would like to mention specifically the um, the conflict. See, this is the interest where originally Sasha, I was t talking to Sasha about it, is the theory of relativity. Like you see, and Marxist view of the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. That's a big black hole. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> it's a big, see, because this is where. Very few people know about this, but there it's available. The information is available. There was a there was a actually a, a very big philosophic debate in the 1920s in the Soviet Union where the Marxist philosophers were rejecting Einstein. They were rejecting the theory of relativity, and physicists, mm -hmm. the Soviet physicists, who were in fact very highly qualified, members of the academy and uh, senior professors in, in Moscow, they were saying that Einstein got it all wrong mm -hmm. and the theory of relativity is not valid. See, this is, and when I looked into that matter, you know, there, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of peer-reviewed articles analyzing and refuting the theory of relativity from the Marxist perspective. 
Okay. You see? And this is what I believe is important is to see, they see that, so this is, the, this is really the dispute between science and, um, well, there, there, is, there is science versus relativism. And I think at that time it was idealism versus materialism. See, idealism. Oh, so accor okay. according to Marxists, that we are interested in scientific materialism, and th the debate was, so Einstein was actually labeled as an idealist. See? So the world relativity, uh, from what I heard, it wasn't even Einstein. Einstein was the front man to present it by, but the uh, work was taken from Henry Poincaré, a French mathematician. And then kind of yes. translated to German and then to English and was in like a spread of a, uh, a dozen years. So. I think the other, what, there's been criticism lately in of Einstein as well because it was uh, the triumph of the mathematicians over the astronomers. The, I mean, the, uh, they, uh, they yeah. tossed out observation, the empirical evidence. That's right. Right? But Absolutely. in England, uh, ironically, it was the English astronomer, big astronomer, astronomer of the day, who introduced uh, Einstein's supposed relativity. Uh, yes, that's the. What was the his name? Hen. <laughs> you put <laughs> you put me on the spot. <laughs> well, it was it was Harrington, Harrington. or, or Harrington. something similar. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So uh, this this was the that was the campaign in the. 1919. Right. And first pay papers were published supposedly 1905. But there was like photoelectric papers in which had nothing to do with it. Now, now you see, this is where, like, I, I believe that the, this is, to me, this is very important. See, classical Marxism is actually opposed to relativism. So this is where I believe that classical Marxism is valuable because it is really a philosophical critique like Einstein and especially Lenin, Vladimir Lenin. See, the important book that, I mean, for, for those people who are interested in <laughs> imperial criticism, materialism and imperial criticism, oh, oh yeah, the so book nice. by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin that was published in 1909. Materialism and imperial criticism. Did you guys both have to read that in, we, in public school? Believe me, believe <laughs> right. me, everybody had to read it. <laughs> and, nobody, <laughs> and nobody can understand a word of it. <laughs> but of course, now I look at it, I look at it from oh a different man. perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I want to so come to a conclusion here. I think we're getting somewhere here. So basically, um, the one thing I wanted to say, I don't know if this is going to bring it back, but what you said, materialism versus idealism or ide yes. right so it seems to me one of the things we've lost certainly when we look around today nobody thinks about the ideal as something that we want to achieve maybe we can never achieve it but it's nice to have it there as something that we can shoot for now we've that seems to be gone we're in a materialist world it's like whatever it is it's like there's no even in art and we see it in art where people aren't striving even for beauty or for anything Right? It's like, here it is, Jackson Pollock. There it is. Well, it's just the, the there is, uh, I, I say that postmodernism is really uh, nihilistic. I mean, they, they discount any theory, the validity of any theory, like everything is, everything is subjective. I mean, that's one of the, one of the most oh, common. I got to tell you, I was sitting in a, in a meeting, right? And a bunch of people trying to do something, right? And then somebody, maybe it was me, asserted something, trying to see if there's common ground for people to find any kind of ground, common ground to move forward. And then somebody said, well, you know, that's the way you feel about it. That's, you know, that's the way it is for you. In other there words, there go. was no way to come yes. together with any kind of common ground, Yuri. That's the zeitgeist, I'm afraid. I mean, there's, that is also called identity politics. Like every little group is for themselves. Right. And nobody's looking at the big picture. And so, well, what the big is that? picture. Let me comment about the big picture because in that narrative, the scientific materialism explaining thing, things from science, knowledge, science, and Latin is knowledge, and that's not only knowledge, hidden knowledge, like uh, magia means hidden knowledge, 
It's uh, open knowledge, something that's shared, that's something that can be repeated. And versus art, art is creating something new. But also then goes to incidentalist principles, so that all expressions are at the same time original and derivative. Hence, we are coming from previous expressions, language, sounds, concepts, and then original part is how we're expressing them. And so in, the, in all those expressions are not fully original and not fully derivative, they're both. And so, and then, so the, uh, the while artists are pursuing the uh, exploration of going beyond their own preconceptions and expectations in an incidentalist kind of uh, approach to art as expression of something new and novel, and uh, uh, the scientists are conventionalists who understand those expressions and they categorize them, they understand the conventions and uh, they create science. How those explore terms. Marxism, so Marxist, Marxist science. This is what I'm saying is that Marxist epistemology and the ideas of scientific materialism, they still have validity because they're based on the ideas of the enlightenment, the traditional ideas of the Enlightenment are actually, that is much closer to the cl classical Marxism. And the, so the Marxist understanding is that like the modern physics is completely gone into relativism and subjectivism. Like there's 12 different dimensions. Yeah, but now you've got new competing scientific paradigms. For example, the electric universe theory or Maybe some I, other I, ones. I think it's very productive. The electric universe is a very productive direction because this is what we, this is the new science that I think that will show good results in the future. So maybe that, and that, of course, if that uh, collectively adjusts our, our worldview, then that could spawn whole new um, political, cultural movements. So it will maybe come back to the Enlightenment, the, the ideas of the Enlightenment and so scientific methods. So science is not oppressive, science is not the enemy. So this is what I'm saying is classic Marxist epistemology. So and well, then I think the neo-Marxist then, what the so-called new Marxists, like how, what do they add then, uh, they are against science, so they are against the b basis of Marxists, so why wouldn't they call themselves something else as you, as you well, said? Well, this is, uh, that's what they're saying, that so the science is oppressive and science is male, like it's male, oh, well, that's <laughs> so somehow it's like chauvinist, you know, like science is male chauvinist. I mean, this sort of thing is very counterproductive. But Yuri, isn't it, isn't all, aren't all these ideas being propagated by the Tavistock Institute to basically ah, there you go. kill that's the West, <laughs> kill the U.S., and uh, let, uh, uh, let some small elite group do global control because they've convinced everybody that we need to move away from scientific progress. Meanwhile, they'll be running the machines. You're taking words out of my mouth. <laughs> so are, you joke? are, are you joking? Yes, yes. No, I'm serious. Like, that is really, you can consider that as really to confuse things. It's yeah. confusion, social yeah. confusion. Yeah. That's what the result of, yeah. I mean, it may well be Tavistock Institute and all that But yeah, they themselves know what the, uh, the narrative... Uh, so in other words, there, there could be a group who seeks control, global control, who's using these as strategies of course, to right. divide and conquer. On a global scale. On a global like scale. You have one that is like scientific materialism on one side with a communist type of countries and uh, yeah and then they have relativism Einsteinian relativism on the other side so Einstein is under attack at this time uh, and there, just in the last few years the speed of light has been shown to be changing like it's not like the the, the, the dogma that the speed of light must always be the same you know is, is been is being uh, increasingly undermined well, it's very uh, it's very kind of uh, uh, skeptical uh, to, uh, question, like they had to come up with a, a relativistic Doppler effect to explain. Oh, to me that makes no shift. sense. The red shift Doppler uh, yeah, effect, yeah, that yeah. is so, so ridiculous. It's kind of, I'm, I'm very uh, skeptical of the whole no, science behind ridiculous. it, or the explanation rather. But as far as the, like, uh, the communist ideology, Marxist uh, scientific materialism, it has no specific uh, 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 ties with the uh, art, in, uh, 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 unlike in relativism, it's tied uh, intimately with the postmodernism. The Marxist theory is not is not really uh, trying to 
really define art. It's not, I mean, they're interested in economics and they're interested in scientific science and politics, but the art, I mean, that's what Lenin said originally, that uh, although I prefer classical opera to all this modernist stuff, but I mean, let them do it because as long, if this is the young generation at that time was very pro-modernist, then he says, this is not our concern. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're doing modernist art that is, that is somehow supporting the revolution, so much for the better. Mm -hmm. So Lenin was very open. Like, the, the, see, Mar Marxism is not is not pushing uh, originally classical Marxism was not pushing any specific artistic ideas. Right. So that's the key here. Like, it's, it was not dogmatic in that area. Okay. So listen, guys, we're gonna have to wrap this up. So okay, I just want to wait. wait, 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 wait I feel like Austin Powers here, but um, and and I'll let you do that in a second here, Sasha. But uh, uh, I just want to say that um, you know, because here in the West, especially in the U.S., not so much Canada, but people are afraid of that term Marxist, right? So what I'm trying to say, uh, Yuri, is that if it is um, if a, a Marxist uh, view in in some cases will help us kind of get a grip of of and uh, perhaps point to a solution to the cultural malaise that we're in, then we don't have to worry that it's called a Marxist analysis. Um, I, and, and, but go quickly, Sasha, but then I want, I want Yuri to, to kind of conclude here and give people Right, but something. I just wanted him to mention maybe uh, the, the, when uh, in the theories the Stalin went against the uh, modernists and all that, and, uh, and uh, he... Uh, the, the KGB put on this famous bulldozer show, bulldozer art exhibit, then maybe Yuri can do. Yeah, well, the, the bulldozer art exhibit is a famous, all the, all the Russian artists know about this. This was an incident, it was under, under Khrushchev. It was like uh, when, it was, uh, it, was, it was in the, it was in the 70s, like ar around the late 60s. When there was the exhibition in Moscow, alternative modernist art, like at that time, uh, Russian Soviet artists were not allowed to do modernist art. It was not funded, and they did it on their own. And they decided to do a uh, avant-garde art ex exhibition, like in an empty parking lot, like a not state-sponsored. Yeah, like exhibit. independent art exhibition yeah. out in the summer in the empty in the empty parking lots in the su suburbs of Moscow, mm -hmm. and and they invited people. Well, it just independent. We don't doesn't cost any money. We just organize the independent art show, and that was considered to be subversive, and so the KGB sent bulldozers. For the opening, for yeah. the art opening, so that was known as the bulldozer art opening. Mm -hmm. So that was, they were cracking down on modernist art. Mm -hmm. But you also saying that uh, suggesting that it could have been staged by the KGB itself as a kind of. Well, they obviously knew. To scare people. They off. obviously knew what was coming down, and they did not prevent. They did not prevent the people gathering yeah. there, but then they send the bulldozers. You know, kind of reminds me of the Vancouver artist, I forget what his name was, but his uh, he announced that he was, as his work of art, was going to take his little pet rat Sniffy and drop a concrete block on his head, and this was going to be his art. So he showed up at the day and the t uh, place where this was to occur, somewhere in downtown Vancouver, and was greeted not by the state uh, the anti art uh, group, but by a bunch of social justice warriors who basically uh, prevented him from harming Sniffy. They they rescued Sniffy the rat. The and the whole thing to me was an incredible work of I art. I have a similar rescue story. That's fascinating. It's amazing that you bring this, bring this up because around, remember Lucky the Goldfish? I lived on uh, Queen Street uh, back in the day, Queen and Mark, and we had uh, art shows we had at the Goulash Party Place. Every uh, uh, weekend we would hang a bunch of art, 40 artists, for eight weeks. We had every Friday we would hang up, and then uh, on the weekend we were uh, opening. And so for the closing of these eight weeks of shows, uh, showcasing different 40 artists, we did this closing ceremony where we did uh, sacrifice of Lucky the Goldfish. And that was supposed to be the boil, uh, the boil like a uh, plate, a uh, boiling plate with uh, boiling water. 
and then we bought a lot of goldfish in a store, fish store. But behind the boiling water, there was uh, in a good cold water. So we put it from the audience perspective, they see the boiling oh. So we dropped it, the, the goldfish, into the cold water, and it was fine. But we, we bought several goldfishes, so in case one dies. So while at the party was commencing to this uh, uh, fake sacrificial moment, uh, the fish was on display in the gallery mm -hmm. and saw some animal uh, concerned citizen came and rescued the goldfish Sweet. and ran with it. And the one that got rescued died. Oh, <laughs> boy. Okay, anyway. listen, we got to wrap this up. But Yuri, so, okay, after all this, well, what do you, I don't know, what can you tell us? What can you recommend? You, what should we do? To sum up. Yeah. To sum up, <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm just saying that um, let us like I, I do believe in science, and I don't believe that science is a process, and so science I believe we need more we need to see ourselves more as a community of like a, a commonwealth you know as opposed to like individual little groups only caring about themselves, like to see it more as a commonwealth where everybody lives together. And also the idea that like I think science is important and it's it should be our guide. Like if we want to overcome our problems, we have to do it scientifically. We cannot do it like I mean mystical. Right. It has like, to make sense. And I see it as a map ultimately we have this dichotomy that we're witnessing of the communist ideology driven by the scientific materialism versus Western capitalist uh, uh, ideolo ideology driven by relativism. And uh, what we can deduce from that, that there's communist ideology while focusing on everyone according to their needs. So basic needs uh, of survival that we collectively share and those uh, focusing on equal and uh, non-discriminatory way just uh, providing those basic necessities to the group. To the common commons, and then there is a, a capitalism where it's providing a free market economy for whatever we individually want. We want this, we want that, and the free market forces provide, in theory at least, those demands of desires that are beyond critical needs. And so uh, the relative is because everyone's wants are relative, uh, depending on who wants what. Uh, so, and, and therefore relativism may be more appropriate for that type of a marketplace driven by secondary desires versus uh, scientific materialism where it's uh, rooted into dealing with uh, critical needs and uh, basic infrastructure and uh, necessity driven uh, models. Now I'm now, we, now what I'm going to say after all this, but I, yeah I guess I, I, I will just uh, I will just say that scientific material well I mean scientific materialism needs to be re re-examined and to see there is good sides of it as well that's what I'm trying to say scientific materialism as well as dialectical materialism and of course there are differences between these two concepts but that may be for some other time.